Welcome back to Producers Toolbox. I'm your host, Carol Adrian, and today we are talking to everybody out there who has gotten their toes wet in content creation, filmmaking, video adventures, and we're going to talk about how to get really great looking video or film without spending a fortune if you feel ready to move up to that next level. So our guest today is our friend Roland Boyden, who is the access manager at public access station Phillycam in Center City, Philadelphia, which is a very large station. And Roland is basically head tech. <laughs> so um, he is going to help clarify for us what do you need to move up a step in your filmmaking, video making, content creation world. So, hey, Roland, thank hey, you. Thanks for having me. This oh. is great. We get to be in person here. and Yeah, yeah we've to... worked remote before. No, so, I... wow. So, the rumor is you don't have to spend a lot of money to set yourself up to make great content. That, yeah, that's always my message. Yeah, and there's a question I get a lot at Billy Cam because of people who come in, they're interested in video, and, and then a lot of times people say, well, yeah, I've, I've been saving up a little and I really want to kind of make this a thing for me. What can I do? And really my first answer is don't, don't spend money because <laughs> uh, it can be just, and I'm super guilty of this, it can be so easy to just, you know, you start going on Amazon, you go on B&H, you start adding things to the cart, you look at a review and it's new and it's shiny and all of a sudden you've, mm. you've bought a lot of things and they sit and collect dust and you don't end up using them. So, so that's always kind of my first message is that it's really, you know, having the I don't know, the creative intention to go out and make something and, and kind of just push yourself to go make it is kind of the main thing. And then as we'll get into, there's plenty of ways you can actually get the, the tech part working. So, But I also have to check myself because I love talking about it. So when somebody says, I want to buy a camera, what camera should I buy? They get a huge email back from me that's like, well, if you want this, it's this. If it's this, it's this. It's because there's no one specific answer for anybody. But I have to remind myself that, you know, I take that seriously. I don't want people spending money they don't have on something they don't need. So... But also, it's not just the equipment, it's developing the skills. And as you go along, like with your basic equipment, your skills are improving, and then you're thinking, okay, I need a this that can do that. And so you're learning, really, what you're going to need further down the road. That's my favorite way for people to kind of start to figure out what, what kind of equipment they do need. And so, so it sounds counterintuitive, like go make a film and I don't have anything yet. But as we've talked about now a couple times, uh, uh, having a cell phone in your pocket is really the, the best starting place. And if you can start making um, you know, some content, even if it's kind of practice content or a little sort of test pilot or something like that, go out and start shooting. And then that'll kind of inform, you know, what are, I call them the pain points for people, like what, what things are happening when you're filming where you really wish you had a, a better tool that kind of addressed that versus I just, I want the shiniest thing or I want the, the highest number, I want the 8K or the 4K or the, it's really more about thinking about what, what problems can getting some extra equipment solve that I'm finding as I go out and make stuff. So, but yeah, starting with the phone is really the, the place to do it and then you can learn from there. You pointed out a pitfall to me, which is, if you are shooting or recording with your phone, you're using your phone. <laughs> that's, I think this, that's, a, that's the single uh, biggest challenge with cell phone filmmaking that I think people don't realize. I think people assume when you're ready to move up, it's because you want the better image quality or it's, they're, you know, they're not a real filmmaker if you use the phone. That's not the case. In fact, there have been actual you know, Hollywood films shot on cell phones. Tangerine is a, a very famous one. Um, that they shot all on iPhones. Um, the real issue is, yeah, that it's your phone. So if you're also on set and you need to text an actor who's late or call because somebody got locked out at the door or check the weather or check, you know, all the things we use our phones for all the time, if your phone is strapped into a, a rig or on a teleprompter or whatever it is, <laughs> then you can't get it or you have to <laughs> be peering into the teleprompter, poking <laughs> buttons and things. So that's really where having sort of a dedicated tool, even if it is a second phone or an iPad or, or some of the cameras we'll talk about stepping up to. Um, that's really the, yeah, the main thing with the phone that I found <laughs> more than any of the other limitations is just, yeah, also, you also need your phone. <laughs> so. Well, making a stronger case for burner phones. There you go, yeah. There or yeah, maybe go. when you upgrade, you, you know, you got a newer, faster phone, but the camera's still great on the older phone, that could just be your, your camera. So. Or, or, you know, kind of figure it out amongst, if you're there with a group of friends, you know, who has the best camera and who has the best phone for texting the actor who locked themselves out. <laughs> well, in terms of technical adeptness or, or ability, what's your opinion of the new cell phones? Can you get good quality? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think, uh, I think um, there's a tendency in the film community to get really 
uh, snobby around gear and particular looks and lenses and things like that, and forget that it's really the story and the you know making uh, you know having compelling people in front of the camera and telling their stories and um, having conflict and emotion and all those things that get people watching. And cell phones can absolutely deliver. Uh, an image that keeps the immersion, you know, doesn't doesn't break the immersion where somebody watching it goes, oh, well, this was shot on a phone. I, I don't want to watch this. Uh, there, I, I really think you can create, you know, if you have that story and that idea. Um, and also it's a place where technology is just um, improving at a rapid rate. So Canon and Sony might release a new sort of uh, camera every three or four years uh, in a in a particular line, um, Apple and Samsung, they're releasing new phones every year and they're spending tons of R&D on new uh, camera features and better sensors and filming in places you could never film before and lower light situations and out at night and I mean there's a lot of advancement happening there so Ooh. yeah I, I find it exciting and uh, yeah there's a sexiness to equipment to to like really like top of the line equipment which is it's very attractive to you know when you are looking at cameras and stuff so now what do you think about recording the audio with phones are they as good it, yeah, it depends on what you're trying to do. It's definitely um, one of the first places that I actually have people think about doing some upgrading. Uh, I think, and I'm again, I'm, I'm guilty of all these things too. I, I find equipment very sexy and I love to <laughs> shop and buy things. Um, but if you have only a certain amount of budget, um, uh, like a lot of people go to the camera immediately and, and that can, you know, add, that can be quite expensive and all of a sudden you have no money left for microphones or lights. So to your audio question, I think audio is, is a great first place to start with an upgrade and that can be um, a boom mic that you can get on a, on a boom. It can be little wireless microphones that can connect back directly to the phone or a little recorder and or a recorder so you can record that audio separately. And most editing software now makes it really easy to sync that audio up. We even do shoots where we just use a second phone as the audio recorder, and this sounds a little wild, but you, if you can strap a phone to like a broom pole, basically, you can get that phone nice and close. You can slip a phone in a shirt pocket. Uh, the Really, the rule of audio is uh, proximity produces the best results out of anything. So I could have a $2,000 microphone over on the doorway here, and it's gonna sound worse than the $50 microphone that's nice and close positioned where it should be. So. Um, but yeah, it is something you have to think about if you're just holding your phone up like this. Um, it's audio is actually the newer phones really pretty good, but it depends, you know, if you're in a loud environment, it's not going to cut out noise the way a professional microphone would. So that could be a first thing you add a, a little wireless kit or something like that. I know my little, um, lavalier mic that I paid $25 for, I get great sound and people will say, wow, your sound's really good. You I know? was blown away by the, yeah, your sound quality when we did our last <laughs> show virtually. And that, that just so proves my point that, um, yeah, you could spend tens, thousands, whatever it is on, on these high quality mics, but that mic does exactly what it needs to do, which is it hooks into your computer and then it gets the microphone nice and close and it sounds great. Um, you know, we have, for folks who do their virtual shows, we have them use little headphones that have a built-in mic, and it's the same kind of idea, that if it just gets the mic it's nice close. and close to you, yeah, then it, it does a, more good than a fancy microphone that's not positioned well, <laughs> basically. <laughs> now, I know that, that you're a fan of not only new equipment, but older equipment. So this, let's talk a little about that. Yeah, this is one of the things I'm super excited about. So yeah, when I'm trying to kind of direct people as to what kinds of things they could look at buying, um, there's some really great deals that uh, can be found if you're willing to buy used. And for some people, that's a little, can be a little nervous, you know, going on eBay and things like that. Um, my experience with eBay has been if you're uh, willing to potentially return an item, they, eBay will always back you up. So you have to kind of be ready to, um, really check your stuff out when you get it and make sure that it's it is what it says it is um, and i have had to return a few things but i've purchased almost all my equipment in the last five or six years used and it's also great it's um a better carbon footprint you're not you know getting all new stuff you're taking stuff that's already there but to me there's some really amazing vintage equipment um i call it vintage but maybe like 10 years old um that because it doesn't do things like shoot 4k and some of the newer standards um, it can be had for incredibly cheap, but these are cameras and lenses and things that were used to, to, you know, make blockbuster movies and things like that not that long ago, and now are just out there for, uh, you know, much less than it would take to get an equivalent sort of brand new camera. Um, some of my favorite images I've ever made um, have been done with that. Actually, I brought a few Ooh, things just because this is the kind of stuff I get super excited about. Um, but this one is a Nikon uh, vintage lens that I picked up. Um, basically at a yard sale, um, but these are like $50 on eBay. And they actually, I call this the Star Wars lens because um, in the first two um, Star Wars movies, they had these beautiful big old anamorphic lenses that are 
are really hard to work with, but they were not uh, suitable for close quarters. So for all the stuff in the Millennium Falcon, they turned to Nikon and they took one of these stills lenses and converted it. So when you see Harrison Ford like <laughs> shooting his gun in the Millennium Falcon uh, in uh, A New Hope, it's basically a modified version of this lens that anybody can go get for between 40 and $60. Um, and the first movie I made with this, I was I actually had a whole a plan to rent a bunch of equipment, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for new, brand new 4K stuff. Um, and I found this camera, which is Ooh. giant, and it's not perfect for everything because it's way too heavy. I much prefer shooting with my phone for size and everything. But this was a camera that I found for, you know, under $500 that at one point um, when it came out in 2011 would have been, I think, like sixteen or $17,000 and was a staple in the film business. But because of that little bit of time and age and it's a little bit bigger and bulkier, um, had it for, you know, basically the cost of an entry-level camera and was able to put these two together, this little lens and this camera, and made some of my favorite images ever. So when I, you know, hold this, whoop, not going to put it on the table there. <laughs> Too heavy. But, uh, but yeah, this is just one of, and, you know, there's lots of cameras like this. Canon and Sony made a whole bunch of cameras that were absolutely the top of the line, um, you know, in the, in the HD era before 4K became a thing and make beautiful images. But because they don't do 4K, the price has absolutely plummeted. And so for a lot of people, I tell them like, it's really, if you look at the images from it, it just kind of evokes a feeling. And that's really the kind of the most important part of it. You can get these beautiful images and save save a lot of money at the same time and also have fun. Is that kind of like when you, when you watch something um, where they do it up like news in the 1950s and there's that, uh, there's a look to it and a sound to it. So is that what you're dealing with when you're working with an older camera that it's, it's almost a period feel? I mean, it can be, yeah. But I, I also find that they really are still pretty like very real even without that the, the 4k that everybody's kind of obsessed with um that because that standard of hd is still very much what kind of movies by the time they finish them and put all the effects and put them in the theater they're basically at that same resolution again so if you wanted to make a totally modern looking contemporary film uh you could with these but if you wanted to kind of push them to their sort of limits and yeah make it a little dreamier and blurrier and feel like it's something out of the 70s or something you can do that too and so it has that kind of versatility. Um, but yeah, I mean, filmmakers for forever have been, you know, the, uh, the, always uh, these different tricks that they would do, like put a little bit of Vaseline on the lens or something, because they, oh, they wanted to- Yeah, exactly, yeah. putting a stocking over it because they wanted to make it dreamier. And, and so to me, like this idea that you would have to spend 10 times as much to get a camera that's so much sharper and shows every pore and all this stuff, that, you know, on these big Hollywood sets, they take these super expensive cameras and then they do everything they can to get rid of all that detail because they want it to be less sharp so they put the stockings and the vaseline and the filters and by the time they do all that it's basically the same resolution as one of these cameras and so you're kind of you're you head it's a head start toward that look that all these hollywood filmmakers are already trying to wow. get and and a lot of new uh lenses that are coming out are being tuned to look as though they're a vintage lens to kind of recapture that nostalgia and not be so clinical um and so I would see these, like, you could get a brand new Zeiss lens for $20,000, and they've tuned it to look like a lens that you can get for $40. And I'm just thinking, like, well, maybe I'll just get the $40 lens then. I mean, obviously, there's some other differences. But it really is amazing just how, uh, you know, the engineering that these companies were doing just for still photography back in the day uh, still holds up all these years later. I mean, it really, really does. When you're working with older cameras or, or recording equipment, now what happens in post-production? Is that affected by... Uh... Yeah, a little bit. So the, the, the biggest thing that kind of comes out of some of these vintage cameras that don't shoot in this 4K resolution is that you just have a little bit less resolution to work with in terms of... I usually tell people, like, you have less resolution to work with if you make a mistake. <laughs> so, so in, in fact, a lot of Hollywood films really don't need that 4K resolution because everything is so perfectly set. They, they know exactly how they're going to frame everything. They know exactly it's all the lighting is controlled. The cameras that have that extra resolution are really more useful for people like who film weddings and things like that because you might not be able to get close enough to the bride. And so later in editing, you want to zoom in more. You, you might realize that you you know, crop somebody a certain way and you want to change it a little. And so that extra resolution actually helps. Um, and so I have to find that for the, for specifically things like filmmaking, that lack of resolution where you would, you would put it in. And to be clear, like HD is still for, for TV, for, for Philly cam, for broad, all the broadcast networks, they're all still just HD. They're not going to 4k. And so even though this 10 years and, you know, 10 times off the price, just because of the, the difference in a few pixels, um, 
it really isn't something that I think to our eye we really um, makes a difference. I don't know. Yeah. So. What about if you know you're mostly going to be shooting interiors or exteriors? Is that a consideration? Definitely, yeah. So there's there's kind of a checklist for cameras, um, and because it's so different for each person, this is why when I get this question, you know, it's not like I just have a template I can send. Get the Canon, you know, whatever. Uh, I I really need to you know bounce back and forth with some emails with folks. Uh, to understand what they're trying to do. But yeah, so um, the low light ability of a camera is definitely a consideration. Um, and, um, but there's- The low light, I'm sorry. Yes, the, the low, low, so yeah, how sensitive is the camera? So if you if you don't have uh, all these nice oh, studio okay. lights and things like that, you're gonna be filming in available light or yeah, at dusk or you know things like that. You, you don't have the ability of a big Hollywood set to put all these giant lights up. Um, and and that really does just depend on the camera. There's there's older cameras that because they weren't trying to be so high density in terms of their resolution, um, are actually better at gathering more low light. And then there's newer cameras that are amazing at low light but have some trade offs. And um, one thing I will say is that's something that people fixate on a lot. Um, and especially for documentary and things like that, it's really good to not have to have lights and things. But you might be surprised how little you use that. And that like if you're filming. A lot of times there's plenty of light around and so I, I, yeah exactly um and when i say like low light it's 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 not so much the ability to click film in complete <laughs> darkness it's just that um you know traditional like an actual film camera that has film in it um takes just an incredible amount of light and that's why you, whenever you see a behind the scenes photo for a hollywood shoot the actors look like they're just you know absolutely blasted with this in, amount this of light big five plate, right exactly yeah. and then you see the screen and it looks all dim and moody and you know they've they've tuned the image so that it doesn't look as bright as it is but they're they're blasting it with light so having those those cameras that are more sensitive is really just about being able to work with a, what i would call like a normal <laughs> amount of light and not needing to have all these huge lights around you but but yeah that's that's a big one um there's some other considerations how portable i mean this is not something i would want to put in a backpack and go backpacking around with and things like that this is really kind of meant to be on a tripod um and so if you're making a short film where it's all going to be on a tripod something like this is perfect but if if it's about being handheld if it's about being portable if it's about moving around then a little small camera that takes still pictures and video would be much better so it, it really kind of depends on yeah what you're trying to do but well let's you brought up something really important which is lighting and lighting is pretty much all i mean a lot of the time on a hollywood set as i understand it is spent oh, getting yeah. the lighting yes. set up yeah so i know you can in, buy inexpensive lighting kits or what would be a good starter thing or is that something when you're starting that you need to think about yeah i mean I, again i think the first place i always go is things that you already have available to you so are you know like when you're trying to set up a room do you just have, have an extra lamp can you the sun is the most just obvious. a regular reading lamp type light yeah yes okay um but yeah if, you, if you're filming anywhere where you have windows with sunlight or uh, the sun outside um then uh you can just do it all with positioning basically so you know put somebody where the sun is kind of backlighting them and then they'll have this sort of like glow around them and things like that um you can get for 10 to 15 dollars those five in one reflectors where which i should have brought as another prop but they kind of pop out and are, are round and you can uh, have a like a gold side and a on a white side where you can kind of reflect light back at somebody so if, if you want to take the sunlight and sort of bounce it toward a side of their face you can you, you can do whole whole movies with just you know some reflectors um, but yeah, from there, there's been kind of an explosion of, of cheaper LED lights. Um, you know, if you go on, I, I try to not recommend Amazon at this point because I actually find they're a little more scammy even than eBay, which sounds crazy. But there's so many sellers doing just strange stuff and, and also just don't treat their workers amazingly well. But we use Adorama as a site we use a lot um, for Philly Cam. And then B&H Photo is kind of the the gold standard for purchasing. And they also both sell used equipment as well, which is great. And let you trade in your old equipment, yes, B&H yes. does. Yeah, yes. yeah, and they'll, they'll make you a pretty compelling offer with your old equipment. Um, and that used stuff comes with at least a limited warranty of some kind, mm -hmm. usually 30 days and, and a guarantee from them. So with eBay, you, you are on your own to kind of check it all out when you get it, um, and you can find some great deals because of that. Um, but if you, if you know you wanna buy used and save a little money and save the planet, um, but you don't want to uh, take that big risk going on Adorama or B&H and looking at used equipment. They have lots of lights, used microphones. Um, a lot of times it's an open box, like somebody just returned it, but you'll get it for quite a bit off. Um, and yeah, I, I usually try to look at um, for lights. Uh, at this point, I would say LED lights. Um, they just generate less heat and take less electricity. Usually they can be powered by batteries, which is really nice. So 
if you're out somewhere. Portable. Where, yes, yeah. Um, and there's uh, there's a lot of great, um, you know, you, again, kind of think about your, your use case. Um, and a lot of times we end up using something like the sun as the primary light and the little light might just be like a little bit of backlight that here or where you get most of them now do um, RGB colors. So if you want to just have like a little bit of a blue cast on somebody because you're trying to suggest there's moonlight or, you know, whatever you're trying to do, you can st kind of stylize it. So they become little tools that help you just augment your image. So it's, it's less about the primary lighting and more about just adding these little kind of finishing touches to it. But I, I am a constant Google and YouTuber. Yes, like, yeah. How do, best way to light X. And there are awesome, you know, short videos about how to set it up. I mean, you can pretty much at this point, I would say, learn everything you need to learn off of YouTube. The one sort of, um, uh, warning I give people is just that you can really easily fall all the way down the rabbit hole and you can before you know it you've watched like 200 videos and you're an expert on something you've never actually done which you know can be good but you can also kind of get in your own head there's a there's a flip side of it where you kind of just have to go and do it and learn how you interface with it because watching you could watch you know a ton of videos of people and how they like to light things and what they look for in a camera. You're never going to know if that translates to your experience until you go out and actually do it. But I, I mean, I'm augmenting what I'm, or uh, I guess, um, yeah, augmenting my learning all the time uh, just by pulling stuff up on YouTube, whether it's a, you know, what's the best way to get a certain look out of this lens or, um, yeah, what are tricks for creating a certain mood? Um, sometimes you'll set up a camera and you'll look at it and you'll go, it's not something's off here, but I, I don't know what it is. And so you can kind of Google like what the mood you were going for, you know, like, and, and why you're not getting it. And somebody has a tutorial that is, you know, like actually you need all the light on the far side from the camera. So the camera's filming the darker side and that'll create that more cinematic look or, you know, everybody's got little tutorials out there, but um, I think it's great because it really means anybody has access to that stuff and just need a little bit of your time really. Well, speaking of access, I have to give a little plug to your station. Yes. And some of the other uh, public access cable stations like Philly Cam, which if you're a member at Philly Cam and you've taken any of the classes, now you lend equipment to members for free, and that's cameras, sound equipment, and lighting. Yes. So you're going to plan for a weekend shoot with some serious equipment that you're not spending any money exactly. for that for the price of your membership fee. Exactly. It, and and it comes with support too. So when we have people check that equipment out at the, you know, our window, um, they can go as far as to set everything up there ahead of time to check it all if they want or set pieces of it up or check it. And when you bring it back, you can ask questions like, I noticed the audio was doing this weird thing. Why was it doing that? And um, so that is a great way and also a way to practice. So we have we have camera, we have sort of overall general camera classes where you can learn composition and general lighting and audio. And then we have more specific um, kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, classes that are for specific pieces of equipment to really kind of learn the buttons and the dials and, and get that sense. And I always tell people that's one piece of it, but really just make a reservation to take it out and film your cat, film your garden, you know, practice. And just uh, you'll learn so much just by, you know, trying to see how it goes and then also trying to edit that footage watch that footage back see when you actually go to kind of put the pieces together what's missing what's there what do you wish you'd done a little differently and the, the more you can do that the better and so philly cam's a great space because it's kind of yeah the, the membership there's 30 dollars. that's pretty low risk and then the, the classes i think at the highest for a six-week class is 75 dollars. so not totally cheap but for the amount of learning you're getting uh, pretty affordable and then from there yeah you just take that equipment out and the more you take it and the more you use it the the, the better you're going to get. Exactly. Yes. Now, if if somebody's starting out and they've, I think what you said about go and shoot, that really is the bottom line to the best way of learning. And you're going to find out where you're good, where it's deficient, where you wish you had more. But if you've done that and you're getting a good feel for it, what would you think is what would you look at first? If you have a little bit of money saved, a couple hundred dollars maybe. Totally, yes. What um, would you get? Totally, yeah. It, it, it does depend a little bit on what kinds of work you're doing. Is it music videos? Is it oh. um, documentary? So usually microphones are my first answer. Before you get the camera and the lenses, look at getting some kind of microphone. Um, but for instance, if you are making music videos, you probably don't need any microphones or audio. So in, in that case, maybe it is... Um, a, a little lightweight mirrorless camera uh, and, a, and a good lens or something like that. Um, and I uh, often tell people, yeah, to just 
try to think of it as a whole package. So it's not just the camera because you can easily kind of burn your whole budget and then you say, well, I got, I got the lens that just came with the camera because I, I ran out of money and that lens that comes with the camera might not be great. And so maybe it's a, a slightly less expensive camera with a slightly more expensive lens would be better or something like that. If you can add the microphone, that might add a lot. So yeah, thinking of it as kind of a whole package of things. But again, if you can come to Philly Cam and take the stuff and use it, you'll know what you like, what you don't like. There's a, a variety of cameras there that you can kind of test out, a couple different brands. You can kind of see what um, you know, fits with your style. The user experience is a big thing too. You can look at all the specs of a camera on paper and say, okay, it's got the bigger sensor, it's 4K, it has this input and this input and it does all this. And, and you can even watch the images that people have created on YouTube, you know, with test footage and you say, oh, that looks beautiful. But then you pick it up to use it and it might just be it's such a pain. <laughs> you know, the menus might drive you crazy or it might just have this one little quirk where it, you know, switches a setting every time you do something or, you know, and you might just be like, I, I can't take it. This is, and you might get another camera that on paper doesn't look quite as sexy, but you just, it feels right every time you're changing menu settings and things that, you know, I usually tell people you're looking for things that get out of your way versus kind of being in your way. So, so you can be sitting there and focusing on the actor or the performance or the shot or things like that. Um, if you're just thinking about cameras and menu settings and things, that's kind of taking you out of it. And so, so that's another way to, to use stuff ahead of time. Um, and, uh, I also just recommend, um, if there's something I feel, you know, like not in the Philly area or uh, don't have a public access station or time to in take the classes and things like that. Um, you can also rent equipment and one place I love is called Lens Rentals, uh, lensrentals.com and they just ship you equipment in the mail, um, sign for it and then you put it back in the same box it came in and ship it back to them and they're really pretty affordable. You can insure everything so you don't have to worry about if it got porch pirated or something. Um, okay. And you can, they're really good, like a rental, a local rental house would let you rent stuff, but they're really meant for people renting like for a whole production, you know, a truck and lighting gear and all that stuff. Lens rentals, you can rent a single camera or a single lens or, you know, two different lenses that you want to kind of put back to back and try. And it's really pretty cheap um, and it's just such a great way to, like if you're thinking about buying a camera, I would definitely recommend if you can. Like get a little project together with friends or something and rent the camera for it and hook it all up and see how it feels. Cause it might be, I actually just did this for a project and I got a lens to go with a new camera I was testing and just to kind of have something to work with. I loved the lens and I ended up kind of despising the camera <laughs> again, cause of some of these weird quirky, you know, button pushing things. And so I, I liked, I just learned a lot from that. And so that's another thing I like to recommend to folks to wow. get that hands on. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Well, that was, a, we could we could go for a couple hours. That was really interesting. Um, so if you're thinking about upgrading your gear, this is these are terrific ways to go. And thank you so much, Thanks for having Roland. me. This is so fun. Oh, yeah. we love when you come on. So thank you so much. And please join us on Producers Toolbox next time where we will be telling you more great stuff. So we'll see you next time. Thank you.